this chapter is biochemistry or the chemistry of life. So we're going to take the things that hopefully we learned in our basic chemistry chapter about bonding and intermolecular forces and polar versus nonpolar and ionic and all of that sort of stuff and acids and bases. And we're going to apply that to the chemicals that make up living things. So the first thing we're going to focus on is the structure of carbon because the even though we've talked about how water is super important for life because it moderates temperatures and keeps us cool and it dissolves things, but what are we we're not made really of water. We're our uh, cells themselves have to be made of something more than water. Water is sort of the in the cytoplasm and it's in our bloodstream and, and etc. So the things we're actually made of, carbohydrates, proteins, fats, and nucleic acids, those are all carbon compounds. And so what makes carbon perfect for this is that carbon has exactly four valence electrons. Now, if you remember, things want to have, elements want to have eight or a full outer shell, right? And they're going to either gain, lose, or share in order to get eight. So if they have only one or two, they're probably going to lose because it's really easy to lose one or two electrons. And that means they're probably going to form ionic bonds because they're going to lose electrons and something else is going to pick them up. And if they have six or seven, it's very likely they're going to also uh, gain electrons and form ionic bonds with something else. And that way they get eight. Carbon, though, has exactly four. It's right in the middle. It, it's not going to gain four or lose four. That's going to be unusual. So what it's going to tend to do is it's going to form covalent bonds, and it does this really well. And so this is a very simple carbon compound here on the right. You can see this is methane, and you can see carbon forming four covalent bonds to hydrogen. So here's just some other pictures of carbon doing all kinds of versatile things here. It can form straight chains. It can form double bonds, and there's not a picture here, but it can form triple bonds with other carbons. It can also form branching chains where a carbon breaks off. You see here um, a carbon going up here. Um, we also see carbon forming ring structures. So uh, hexagons and pentagons are going to be a common thing that carbons are going to do in organic things. So let's talk a little bit about organic. So an organic, organic literally means from life. Originally, it was thought that these compounds were only found in living things, um, and so the name sort of came from there, but we know that's not necessarily true, uh, but the name sort of stuck. So organic means from life, and organic things don't just contain carbon. Technically, we say that organic things contain carbon and hydrogen. In fact, if you really want to get technical, carbon dioxide would not actually be considered organic. Um, it's just a simple carbon compound, and real organic carbon compounds are hydrocarbons, which are these carbon and hydrogen backbones. Now, uh, the simplest one I had drawn on the previous slide was methane, but here's some other hydrocarbons, just carbon and hydrogen in a chain. Now, I wanted to show you this because they like to write these in a, like a condensed format. It's not completely condensed, because if you think about it, completely condensed would be this, right? C2, you know, H6. Technically, that would be the fully condensed. But a common thing you'll see in organic chemistry is they'll write it like this. And this is kind of misleading because it makes it look like it's doing this, like carbon, hydrogen, 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 carbon. That's not what's happening here. In fact, be aware, hydrogen can only make one bond. Hydrogen is never, ever going to form double bonds or triple bonds or be found in the middle of a molecule. Hydrogen can only stick off the ends of a molecule. It can never be in the middle making more than one bond. So even though they're drawing it this way, this is what it actually looks like. So they're sort of symbolizing here that these three hydrogens are on carbon number one, and then these two hydrogens are on carbon number two, and then these three hydrogens are on carbon number three, um, so that's the condensed formula. I just wanted you to be aware that if you see it written this way, this is not what's happening. It's actually structurally, it's this picture on the right. Also, um, you can get a mathematical formula for this. So if it's just a straight chain, a linear chain like these two here and here, um, and all the bonds are single bonds, so notice all single bonds between the carbons, this is actually 
a mathematical way you could calculate the formula for the hydrocarbon. So Cn H 2n plus 2. So n can be any number. This could be a very small thing. The simplest, remember, was methane. n was just 1. Well, if C is 1, 2 times 1 is 2 plus 2, it would be CH4. So for practice, I ask what the formula for octane is. Now, I don't expect you to know all of your prefixes, octo, and you know, all of that, but I just figured people probably knew octo, so that's why I chose this one. So for octane, it would be eight carbons, right? Eight N would be eight. So octa is eight. So if N is eight, it would be C8H 8, 18, right? Two times eight plus two. Now it also turns out that hydrocarbons um, can store energy. So this is why gasoline has a lot of energy. It's, it's the main component of gasoline is octane and octane is full of energy. This is also why fats store energy in your body. It turns out fats, we're going to learn, are very long chains of hydrocarbons. And we'll talk later about how does that store energy? Why is that full of energy? But in essence, um, you know, that's why fats have so much energy. Uh, also, very important, hydrocarbons are nonpolar, which means how are they gonna behave with water? They're not gonna like it, right? So oil, is made of long chains of fat. It's made of long chains of hydrocarbons. Of gasoline, long chains of hydrocarbons. And so things that are non-polar, not everything that's non-polar is made of hydrocarbons, but just be aware that hydrocarbons are uh, non-polar. So this molecule would be non-polar. This would be non-polar. These things would be repelled by water. They would not dissolve in water. All right, now, the things that we're made of, the carbohydrates and lipids and things we're going to be talking about, are not just hydrocarbons. That's sort of the base. We start with carbon and hydrogen, but what's gonna happen is some of those H's, the hydrogens, are gonna be replaced with these special groups, and they have their own names. They're called functional groups. Now, we're not gonna learn every functional group that exists, but we're gonna learn the ones that are most common in living things. Also, be aware that we're gonna use the letter R, sort of like how in algebra you use X to represent a variable, right? Uh, in organic chemistry, we use R to represent a variable. In other words, if I'm focusing on a particular R group, like hydroxyl, which is the first one that we're going to learn, I don't wanna draw out the whole thing that it's attached to, because that might confuse you. So instead, I'll just put an R here. This basically means it's attached to some carbon compound. So this is a carbon, and then it could be a ring of carbon, a chain of carbon, whatever, but we're focusing on the functional group. So be aware when you see the letter R that R is not an element itself, that R is actually the um, attachment point for the functional group. All right, so we're going to run through these. So the first one is called a hydroxyl. So it is an OH. You may remember hydroxide from your polyatomics, and then it's connected to the carbon chain here at point R. This functional group happens to be polar, which means it likes water. It is, tends to be found on sugars. Another place you'll find this is on alcohols. In fact, typically things that have OH groups end in OL, all. So here's two examples, glucose and ethanol. So glucose, look at all the hydroxyl groups on glucose. This is why sugar dissolves well in water, because it's got a whole bunch of these hydroxyl groups stuck to it. Now, ethanol does not dissolve in water very well, even though it does have this. So this is polar, but remember that this is nonpolar. So this is why in the lab, ethanol dissolved the iodine. Iodine was nonpolar, and it dissolved well in ethanol. Even though ethanol does have this little polar portion, overall, ethanol tends to be a nonpolar molecule. Our second one is called a carbonyl. So a carbonyl is when you have a carbon double bonded to oxygen. Now it turns out there's two separate names for these depending on where in the carbon chain uh, this, this carbon double bonded to oxygen is found. So if it's found somewhere in the middle of the chain, meaning there's some carbon thing over here and there's some carbon thing over here, it's called a ketone. It does not have to be symmetrically right in the middle of the chain. Sometimes you'll hear about ketones, people who are diabetic, if their blood sugar gets high, um, ketones are a byproduct of, I believe, fat metabolism, and you can, it, they'll say that they're spilling ketones in their urine. High ketone levels can be, can be dangerous, so it's a measure, it's a, a metabolic product that we make. 
Aldehyde is when this carbon double bonded oxygen is on the end of a molecule. So there's a carbon chain of some kind over here, but then this is just the end portion. And the hydrogen here is just taking that fourth spot. Remember, carbon always makes four bonds. So here's one, two, here's number three, and that fourth one is, it's on the end, so it's just a hydrogen. We find aldehydes and ketones in proteins, carbohydrates, and other molecules. Um, here, this is a picture of acetone, nail polish remover. This is a ketone. See how there's the carbon double bonded oxygen, and there's a carbon on both sides. Now this one, again, is symmetrical. They don't have to be symmetrical like this, but you'd have to have carbons on both sides for it to be a ketone. Um, this is propanal and aldehyde. Turns out that aldehydes tend to end in al, and ketones end in own. Um, but this, notice how it's on the end, right? It's not in the middle. There's no carbon here. It's just a little hydrogen. It's sort of a space taker for that end portion. All right, the next one is a carboxyl group. So this is sort of the shorthand way of writing it, but this is the Lewis structure. Three-dimensionally, it looks like this. So it's carbon double bonded oxygen, but with an OH there. And it turns out this has another name. It's also called a carboxylic acid group. And that's because it tends to lose this hydrogen. It breaks off. And so it's behaving as an acid. Because remember, that's what acids do. They give up hydrogens or add hydrogens in a solution. Now, we find these on amino acids, which are the building blocks of protein. And we also find them on fatty acids, which are the building blocks of fat. In fact, that's why amino acids are called amino acids because of this acidic group. Uh, and this you don't need to know, but this is um, just to show you what I'm talking about, of how it behaves as an acid. So it's showing how this hydrogen tends to break off, and that's what gives uh, vinegar its, its sour, tart taste, is acetic acid in the it's dissolved in water, basically, and that's what's making vinegar. All right, our next one is called an amino group. So this is sort of the short, condensed way of writing it. This is the Lewis structure of the amino group, and it behaves as a base. Look here. Here's an H2. That's our amino group, but look what it does. It tends to pick up hydrogens, so it behaves as a base. Um, it is found in amino acids. So the name amino acid actually comes from two things. It comes from the fact that all amino acids have an amino group, and they have a carboxylic acid group on them. And amino acids, if you've ever heard of somebody taking amino acid supplements, these are the building blocks of proteins. The next one's called a sulfhydryl. That, to me, is easy to remember because sulfur, it's the only one that has a sulfur on it. It is sometimes called a thiol. That's not as easy to remember. Um, and this one is very important in proteins because proteins tend to fold up, and this sulfhydryl group um, when you have two amino acids that both have this, what will happen is when the protein folds up into its final shape, we'll talk about this in a, uh, another portion of this lecture, see what happens. The sulfhydryl from this one and the sulfhydryl from this one end up forming a covalent bond. And this turns out to be very important in stabilizing protein structures. Um, notice, again, this is an amino acid. It's flipped on its side, but here's your carboxyl group. This is a carboxyl group we just learned about. And this is an amino group that we just learned about. So this is an amino acid, and this is uh, another portion of that amino acid that has the sulfhydryl group. All right, phosphate can be written lots of ways. Uh, sometimes it's written like this. Sometimes it's written with this oxygen over here, and the reason that they're doing that is because they're representing how when you actually draw it, this oxygen is what attaches to the R. So this is phosphorus surrounded by four oxygens. It tends to lose um, hydrogen. It can also be drawn this way with like a hydrogen here and a hydrogen here, but these tend to break off. So it, again, behaves as an acid. And where it's important, and this is just to show you it uh, forming an acid. You don't have to know this. I just wanted to show you what, why it's considered an acid. Um, and it's very important specifically in DNA and in ATP, adenosine triphosphate, you may remember that as our energy source. And um, here's adenosine triphosphate, tri for three. It's got three phosphates on it. All right, and last but not least, a methyl group. So methyl is nonpolar. In fact, amino acids with methyl groups are nonpolar amino acids. 
Um, it also shuts DNA down, which is kind of interesting. 